first, the second, and the fourth verse, verses 1, 2, and 4, take time to be holy. Let's stand as we sing. Take time to be holy, speak oft with thy Lord, abide in him always, and feed on his word. Make friends of God's children, help those who are weak, forgetting in nothing his blessing to seek. Take time to be holy, the world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus, like him thou shalt be. Thy friends in thy conduct, his likeness shall see. Take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul. Each thought and each motive beneath his control. Thus led by his spirit to fountains of love. Thou soon shalt be fitted for service above. Thank you. You may be seated.
Now can you hear me? <laughs> okay, we'll try it again. I hope everybody had a good week in. But uh, I'm gonna start off in uh, uh, First Samuel, First Samuel 17, verse 31. Uh, when Eric asked me to uh, teach this class or just this one time. I was wondering what I was going to speak on, and uh, I went to a friend of mine's funeral about a month or two ago. He had passed away suddenly, and uh, while I was sitting in the back of the church, about where Pat is right now, uh, the people that was giving his eulogy was talking about all the things that they remembered about him. And uh, but uh, some of the things I remembered about him, they never spoke about, and I thought it was a shame. But uh, I remember my buddy Justin was his name, and I remember when he was in church, uh, me and him would. Uh, go out and visit on visitation, and uh, we spent a lot of time out of church, frog gigging and stuff like that right there. But I remember one time when me and him was out, we went in to visit another friend of ours that was dying of cancer. And we went to his house, we went in and we prayed with him, and he ended up asking the Lord to save him. And I remember uh, me and him coming out, and Justin, that was his first time, I guess, who's ever led anybody to the Lord or took part in it. And I remember him going, we were sitting inside the truck, and he got so excited I won't say it in front of the mic here. He got so excited, he took his fist and said, and just hollered real loud. And said, let's go find another one. Let's go find another one. He was so excited. But as time progressed, people in church heard him, and he got out. And I got to thinking about that while I was in the funeral, while I was in the church. 
And all the people that was talking about him never really spoke about his time when he was walking with the Lord. And I thought that was a shame. But I got to thinking about him. And I think, you know, if he was, I don't know how the Lord allows things to happen or why he does. But, I mean, sometimes I wonder if I could talk to him now. If I could talk to Justin right now. And he can listen to me. And I know he's in heaven right now. I'll be with all my heart. He would holler back down at me and, and would tell anybody, stay in church. Stay with God. He knew what it was like to walk with God. And he got away. And I just got to think about him. And I got to think about the Bible. And I wrote my message or my lesson for a time to remember. And how we all times, you know, we had the funeral with Pleasant Grove Christian Church there in Bennett. And I grew up there. And when I, every time I walk into that church and I walk down the pew, I remember the times when I was a young child. I remember the, the Christmas plays that we had up here. I remember over here we used to have an organ. And Brenda Brown was playing piano, and I think it was Don Daniels preaching that night, I think. But I remember coming down and asking the Lord to save me right over yonder. When I, paused, when I walked by that, I remember that. And sometimes I swing by the cemetery on the way back from work. i done it about a month ago, and I'll make my rounds to the graveside of my friends that has went on and passed away. And I'll walk by my grandma's uh, tombstone and read some of the epitaphs on there. And I get to thinking to myself, I says, do we remember? And I got to thinking about David. Uh, and there's a lot to say about David. Uh, during this time that we're going to uh, speak about, he was around 15 years old when he went up against Goliath. I'm thinking to myself, you know, when you're 15, you know, all of us you know that you're 10 foot, two, 10 foot and bulletproof. You don't think nothing ever will happen to you. But we look here at David. We'll start off in verse 17. No, excuse me. Chapter 17, verse 31. It says, when, And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he is a man of war from his, from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and he took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered him out of his, out of his mouth. And he was rose against me. I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. And thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing that he hath defiled the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord hath delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear. He will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put on a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, and he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with thee, for I have not proved them. And David put, off, put them off him. And he took his staff in his hand. He chose five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a sheep shepherd's bag, which he had even in a script. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near unto the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bared the shield went before him. And when the Philistines looked about and saw David, he, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and the ruddy and a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistines said unto David, Come unto me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistines, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come with thee in the name of the Lord of hosts and God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. This day will the Lord deliver thee out of my hand, and I will smite thee and take thee, take thy head from thee, and I will give it to the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day and to the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord save not with the sword or the spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass, when the Philistine arose, he came and drew nigh to meet David. And David hasted and ran toward the armies of the Philistines. And David put his hand in his bag, took the sense of stone, and slank it, and smote the Philistine in his forehead, and the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face into the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him, and there was no sword in the hand of David. One thing that I like and what I caught uh, here is when the Philistine came out, David ran to him. David ran to him. And 
I try to look at the Bible characters when I read them. I try to put myself in their position. You know, if I was 15 years old, I read somewhere where David was around 15 years old when he went against Goliath. At 15 years old, and I was going to go against someone, a giant such as a Philistine at that time, no doubt he had fear in his heart. The Bible don't say it, but knowing humanly, he probably had just a little bit of a fear. But we know that fear, but he was courageous. But we know that, that the, uh, courage, being courageous is not the opposite of fear. It's just when fear's before you, you don't let it stop you. And it didn't let it stop David. But we see here that David ran toward him. But what I like about uh, this particular uh, uh, verse that I'm, or part of the Bible I'm talking about, there's so much to talk about David, but this right here, David remembered. He remembered back when he was in the field and the bear and the lion came out in him. What did that do? That prepared him for his next uh, battle or next trial or next uh, obstacle in, in his life. And I got to thinking about that. First of all, he remembered. He remembered God saved him from the lion and from the bear. And he just didn't keep it to himself. He shared it with other people. And no doubt, it was a personal thing to him. You know, he was out there, think about it. He was out in the field. Bible don't say if he had anybody with him or not. If he did, I didn't catch it. But he was out there by himself in the field with all the flock. And here comes a lion. Here comes a bear. And to him, that was a personal trial. He didn't have a whole army behind him that's going to help him. And there's going to be times in your life that there's no one that can really help you. I remember of a young lady, and I won't mention her name, she had lost a daughter, and uh, someone told her she needed to uh, go see a counselor because it was hurting her so bad. And, and she made a statement that said, no counselor can heal my broken heart. Nobody can talk to her to heal it. And I got to think about it, and that is true. And there's going to be times in all of our lives where we hurt so bad or things in front of us, obstacles that, that really no one knows. Probably everyone here right now has probably something in front of you that you really don't want nobody else to know. But that's okay. No one really needs to know it if it's that personal to you. But we see here David in the middle of the field, in the middle of, a, of, a, of all the sheep, and the lion and the bear come out. But he stood courageous. He didn't shrink back in fear. He knew God was with him. First time when he, the lion come out, he smote him, the bear come out. God was with him both times. And no doubt, whatever you're going through, whatever you're going to face in life, or I'm going to face in life, God's going to be there for us too. We need to remember that. This was a time for, uh, for David to remember. It's time for him to remember. And then as he went into the, to the, the next phase of his life, as the, as the Philistine came upon him, what did he do? He didn't hold all that, that personal testimony of his. He didn't hold it to himself. He shared it with other people. He shared it with King Saul. And what did that do? That encouraged King Saul to say, well, if God did uh, deliver him from the lion and the bear, maybe he will deliver him from this Philistine. And no doubt, it's a great witnessing tool for ourselves. Because you know yourself, whatever we go through in life, it wasn't there just because of accident. God allows to go, let us go through it. And sometimes it's easier said than preached. But you know, when David shared this with King Saul, he encouraged King Saul to let him go on and do this. And it's a great witnessing tool. Because a lot of times when you're at work and you have went through things in the past and everyone here has lost loved ones, has had people sick, or maybe a job has have failed you and you don't know what the world's going to do, and when you get through that, when you're at work and someone comes to you and their heart's broken, they don't know what they're going to do, guess what? We need to do like David done. We need to share it with the other people. Because if we hold everything to ourselves, then God's really not getting the glory. But you know yourself, when you have a personal trial and God delivers you through it, it means more to you than it does anybody else. We can have a need in this church, and we can pray for it, maybe a financial blessing. And we can rejoice together. And it doesn't mean a lot to you. But you know what? As time goes on, we seem to forget. But you know what? If you've got something that's been, you've been battling for years on end, and you really seek God, and you seek God, and finally, finally, God delivers you from it. You won't forget it. You won't forget it. I remember I was listening to uh, Maze Jackson on the Internet one day. This, uh, I think it was yesterday, before yesterday. Anybody remember Maze Jackson? Everybody hear about Maze Jackson? To me, he's just one of the greatest old-time preachers they ever lived. That's to me. He used to come to the Grove, and I was showing uh, Jensen uh, a little, little small excerpt of him, and he was preaching about this guy, and he battled uh, alcohol all his life. His name was Mayo. You may, if you ever heard Mays for a long period of time, you've probably heard this sermon before. And I got to thinking about him. This guy named Mayo, he was an alcoholic, and uh, he was so much of an alcoholic that May says that he would drunk away all the money in the house, and his small child died just a little infant, 
because of malnutrition because he was actually so bad he didn't even feed that child. And he took the, they went to the funeral home and they placed that little old baby in the, in the casket that that guy was so much of an alcoholic when no one else was looking, he reached inside that casket and pulled off the shoes of his little baby and put them inside of his coat and went down to the local tavern and traded him for a bottle of whiskey or another hit of alcohol. You know, and that's how bad. But you know what? It don't end there. He fought that thing, he fought that thing, he fought that thing. And you know what? That same guy now said he went to Mays Jackson. I was sitting there reading it or listening to him. Mays Jackson says he came down to the altar 14 times. I don't know if he made 14 professions or if it just finally dawned on or got whatever the case may be. But Mays says he got down 14 times at different uh, times of the service or different, across the span of time. And finally he stood up and he says, I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. And he said right after that, he said he went to his little baby's graveside and took the bottle and he got called into evangelism. That same guy that sold his baby's little shoes, he went to his graveside of his little baby and took the beer bottle, liquor bottle, and busted it. And he says, I'm free. I traded in the bottle for the Bible. Of course, I know the little baby couldn't help it. I mean, couldn't hear it. But he gave him, I guess, that release. But you know what? I'm sure that guy's probably dead now. But you know what? If you talk to him and, 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 and ask him how much of a victory, that was a personal, personal war for him. But you know what? When God delivered him from it, you know the, the release that came off of him. And that same God that worked in his life, that same God that worked in David's life, that same God that worked in all the people of the Bible, it's the same God that you serve, whatever you're going through. Because I like to use the Bible to help people in their lives too. But that same God that helped those people out is the same God that can help you out. So whatever your trial is, whatever your storm is, whatever it is, you have lack of freedom in, God can meet it. The question is, are you going to hang in there? I've got several friends of mine that used to be in church on fire for God, you know, witnessing the people going to this and that and going to church faithfully, but got out. And no doubt when they crossed over and went into glory, because I believe they were saved, oh, if they, could just, if they could just talk to us and say, it ain't worth it all, it ain't the world, is nothing, the world has nothing to offer, stay in there, stay in there, stay in there. And that same God that worked in their lives, the same God that will work in yours. But i got to think about that. But we see here that David shared that. He shared it with other people. And when you're at work, and you're at school, if, of course I don't think anybody here is in school, but wherever you guys may be at, you can use it in other people's lives. Because you're going to come in contact with people that's, that are going through things. And it's our job, our responsibility to share what God has done in our life through his word, through personal uh, accomplishments. I say through him, not for our own, but personal trials to share with them. Because if you're around a lot of people, the same people all the time, like I am, you know, with the state, you know, nobody ever leaves. So you work on the same one for 10, 15 years. I think of Todd Swain, he's with his officers probably the whole career. And you get kind of personal, and they kind of share a thing. I think Bobby Thomas, he's probably got a lot of customers or employees around him. And, and you, you show that Christian character, and you show them that, you know, when things are going on in your life, that they don't make you crumble, and you don't run away, and, and you lean on God. There's going to come a time when they're going to come to you. And they're going to say, man, I, I'm going through a divorce or this is happening, this is happening. But you know what? As David remembered what happened to him and out in the field, he shared it with Saul. That is your opportunity to say, hey, you know, I've been where you've been at. I might not be exactly where you're at. And then again, you may be exactly where he's at. Then you can share your personal testimony with him or her and then encourage them. And then maybe if they're lost, you can say, you know, have you ever asked the Lord to save you? Because I know God will help you. But you got to make that first decision and ask God to save you, and he will work in your life. And there's an opportunity to, to witness someone and maybe lead them to the Lord. But we see here, that's what David done. But it don't stop there. David was not a perfect man by no means, okay? There's so much to talk about in David's life, there's no way that we can narrow it down. But I'd like to skip back over. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it to you. But we look in uh, Psalms 51. I'll read it. It says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee alone, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mayest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. 
Behold, I was shapen in, in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the, hinder, in the hidden part, that thou may, shalt make me known wisdom. Purge me with high spot, and I shall be made clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sin, and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore me into the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy way, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltless, O God, thou, thy God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou darest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. Thou sac the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build up, build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then shalt thou offer bullocks upon the altar. But we see here in the life of David, there was so much to talk about. We see here him at 15 years old, fighting off the line of the bear, going against the Philistines. And then really, while he was fighting, going up against the Philistines, he had a lot of obstacles there. People told him, you know, you know, here he is just ready. His countenance wasn't like a big uh, soldier back in the, in the Roman days, you know, or during the, the Bible time like that. And we see here David, and, and then the Philistine come up against him, and then mocks him, mocks God. But you know what? He still stood firm. But, you know, as we go on through David's life, you know, he made some mistakes, just like any of us do. Each one of us here makes some mistakes. You got up this morning, you might have got an argument with your spouse, or the case may be, I don't know. But we see here David messed up with Bathsheba. Okay, but yet he was confronted with it with the prophet Nathan. But what I like about uh, uh, David is he didn't try to, well, she shouldn't entice me. She shouldn't have been on top of the, of the building, you know, taking the bath. He didn't try to do none of that. He took responsibility for his own actions, for his own sin. Okay, and a lot of times we as Christians don't want to say, well, well, you know, he shouldn't have made me mad. Well, she shouldn't have done that to me. He shouldn't have done that right there. But you know what? That don't cut it. You know what I'm saying? If you just go ahead and take responsibility, just like David did, then God can work in your life. And then you can then you can experience his forgiveness. I think it was Jan said something to me one time about, you know, uh, people not forgiving. It's like when someone's done you wrong, she said, it's like you're drinking the poison of unforgiveness and expecting them to die. But it's not going to happen that way. And I've said this before. I remember a, a gentleman who'd done me wrong, and uh, I held on for a long time, mad, didn't even want to look at him. And every time I looked at him, I just wanted to just choke him. I was just being honest with you. But uh, after a period of time, I started having massive headaches. And then one day I was listening to Charles Stanley in my bedroom, and he got talking about forgiveness. And he said, everything that God has forgiven you for, what have you the right not to forgive other people? And that's easier said than done. Don't get me wrong. All right, but I fell on my knees and I asked God to forgive me. And I've probably said this before, but right then and there, instantly, I'm not lying to you, instantly my headache left. What it was is I was just harping up unforgiveness for him. That's all it was to it. And when I see this guy today, we still talk. I shake his hand and we try to be a friend of each other. But we see here David, what I like about David is when he uh, was confronted with his sin by the prophet Nathan, he took responsibility for it. But you know what? Somewhere down the line, he remembered. What did he remember? He remembered he, he still served a loving God. He still remembered that he let, served a forgiving God. He still remembered that there was a God who didn't throw away his salvation. But if you'll notice, he says, restore to me the joy of my salvation. He didn't say restore to me my salvation. A lot of people believe you can lose it and regain it. You can't do that. You know, if you, that's the way you believe, then you need to get into your Bible because if you have to work at it to keep it, then you really wasn't a free gift. You know what I'm saying? But we see here, David, he knew that he served a loving God because he knew he, knew he served a caring God and forgiving God. And he expressed that in the scriptures for me and you for, for, to, to, to uh, encourage us. And that same God 
that he serves, that same God that forgave him, that same God that loves him, that same God that he shared and God had worked him through things, that's the same God that we serve. That's the very same God that we serve. Uh, I ain't got a whole lot to say, and that's about sums up the most majority of it. But there's so many people in our lives that we walk with and talk with that we can uh, share God's love with. And it don't, have, it don't always have to be handing out a tract. It don't always have to be uh, uh, witnessing verbally all the time. Just a good deed. I remember there's a guy that I used to go to church with, and he's saved now. And he said there's a lady that he went to church with, and he said she always, when she's seen me, the every thing she said, only thing she ever said to me was, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. He said that's the only thing she ever said to me. She said, but no, that right there was an inspiration to me because I knew someone was praying for me. Everywhere you go, it may be just a kind act or a kind word. I was reading or listening to uh, uh, David Jeremiah one time. I don't know if I told this story or not, but he said there was a young girl in a high school. It was a young girl. No, it was a young boy, and he was bullied. And uh, I know we have a young girl here. I don't know what school she goes to, but they say bullying is prevalent now. But here's a young girl or young boy, I believe it was. He was in school at a locker, and the bullies come by and knocked all of his books out of his hands, and everybody just laughs at him. And they just tormented him. This is a true story. They just tormented that fellow all through his years. Well, he said that day, I'm tired of it. I'm going to go home and I'm going to end it. He said, well, he's going to go home and hang yourself or kill himself. He didn't say how, just kill himself. Well, at the end of that day, there was a, they knocked his books out of his hand again, and this one guy seen it, and he intervened. He stopped. He done one small act of kindness, and you think this is nothing, but all they done was help pick these books up and help straighten himself back up. He just got down on his knees, got the little boy's books up, stacked them back forth, and handed it to him. And that little boy says, I was going to go home and end my life. And, uh, but, uh, because of your act of kindness. And he said four years later or three years later at high school, he was honored as valedictorian. And his uh, speech to his senior class, and he honored that boy. And that boy didn't even know what he'd done. But he got up during that time, and he, had, and he told his story. And he looked at that young boy, and he said, because of you, I'm here today. Because of that one act of kindness, that one act of love, and you stopped and just helped me pick my books up. Stop me from ending my life. And I'm thinking to myself, how many times did I go through a day's time where I can express God's love? Whether it be helping someone open the door up, giving someone a smile, encouraging somebody, giving out a track, you know, sharing my personal testimony, sharing what God has done for me, sharing how God has got me through this trial, how God has, has, has saved me and has went through this right here, and share it with people. But yet we're so easy to hold it in. And sometimes we are fearful. And sometimes, you know, I don't know. I remember one time I worked at the service station. There's one guy that I wanted to witness to really, really bad. But he was, he'd was he been in so many fights. He'd been put so many people in the hospital. He was a, he was a rough. I remember one time I felt like the Lord was going to give me to give him a track. And I had that track in my hand. I, honestly, I was and really nothing, nothing to fear because me and him was pretty decent friends. But I remember taking the track out of my hand. My hand just almost like he's right here shaking. But I handed it to him, and he took it. But, you know, my heart just beating out of my chest. But you know what? A lot of times that prevents us from handing out a track. And a lot of times you don't have to get into a, a just a, a sermon. A lot of times we'll just go, I'll go somewhere and say, listen, if you don't go to church nowhere, here's ours. More than welcome to have you visit. And just leave it at that. And if they open up the door to want to talk about it, hey, there it is. There's your wits in the spot. But going back to David, that we see here in, in the beginning that David was in the wilderness, basically, or in the field, and God used him. And during that time, he went against the Philistines. What did David do? He remembered. He remembered that. And then, as he went on through his life, there's a big gap in there, I know that, but there's not enough time to go through it all. But when he got into the Psalms 51, he got confronted with, uh, with the prophet Nathan. He remembered he remembered. So I'm asking you, what do you remember? Have you forgot what God has done for you? Have you forgot what God has purged you from? Have you forgot what our sole responsibility is, is to really to get the lost in or to encourage people? It's our job, you know, just to pray for them for nothing else. But just please, going through life, and I'm challenging myself too, because I get uh, too relaxed sometimes. 
I get my busy my own life, and I know Gordon. He's a, I think you're a salesman. You know, we he, I know he may be on a, a tight schedule, and we all get busy. I know you, you're in school, and you might not be the most popular thing to talk about religion or God. I understand that, but you know what? There's going to be times when you're one on one with people. I know that. You know what I'm saying? So just try your best. Remember what God has done for you, and share it with other people. Okay? That's all I really got to say. I won't keep you long. Well, it's Gordon Hill. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Anytime I teach, I'll usually ask that. I guess none. So, you might get a prayer request you couldn't think of a while ago. Remember Landon, I said a while ago, he goes tomorrow to Moses Cone to see what they find out or do not find out. Okay, well, let's dismiss. Father, we do thank you for this day you've given us. We thank you for life, health, and strength. And I pray, Father, that you'll help each individual here. I know, Father, we all have uh, different, different obstacles in our life. Some is different from others. Some is the same. But you know, God, we serve the same God, the same God that delivered David, the same God that delivered him from the Philistines and from all the trials of his life. We still serve the same loving, forgiving, and caring God. Help us not to remember that. Help us all to have a personal relationship. And Father, that would you would know us, and we would get to know you more and more each day. Father, we love you. Thank you for your many blessings. Give us a good day. Help Pastor uh, uh, Troy as he speaks, and speak to all of our hearts. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.